Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you came back again this Sunday and looking forward to finishing up our, uh, our lesson on abortion. And as you know, I'm upstairs preaching in church at the moment, so I'm recording this a few days ago. Uh, but what I'd like to do is continue our talk last week about the ethics of abortion from a Christian perspective. Last week, we, we looked at all the uh, pro-choice arguments for abortion, tried to understand why people hold that position. And then uh, we began to talk about why uh, Christians disagree with that. So what I'd like to do is pick up there and talk about what is a Christian case for a pro-life position when it comes to abortion. So notice, first of all, um, on the screen here, there's a number of positions that those who profess Christ take on abortion. Uh, evangelical feminists are, uh, tend to be pro-choice. They believe a woman's right to decide what to do with her body is a higher priority than the right of the fetus to live. And um, this view is tend to be found in mainline denominations, uh, theologically liberal churches, where they don't acknowledge the life of the baby as, uh, as something to be protected unless the baby is wanted. Another position, uh, moderate evangelicals accept abortion as morally acceptable uh, in cases of rape, incest, and the severely physically or mentally handicapped. So this, this view generally stands against abortion but does acknowledge or does believe that there are uh, cases where abortion would be a necessary thing or even a good thing. The moderate pro-life position holds that abortion is wrong in all cases after the cell mass attaches to the wall of the uterus. In other words, between days 6 and 14 of a pregnancy, the fertilized egg attaches to the wall of the uterus and then becomes uh, begins to grow. So these this view would argue that um, any uh, abortive pill, such as RU486 or the morning after pill, that could be taken after a, a sperm and an egg unite and fertilize the egg, that that's okay to destroy that, um, that fertilized egg because until it attaches to the wall of the uterus, it is, it is not fully viable, a human being in their opinion. The problem with this view is that scientists don't really know exactly when, and it's probably different in different cases for when this cell wall attaches. So it becomes problematic to hold this view uh, because we're not sure when early in the pregnancy this happens. And then there's the traditional pro-life view that says upon conception, at the moment the egg and sperm unite to form a new, unique uh, individual, genetically unique, different from the mother and the father, and yet connected genetically, Upon conception, any induced abortion is morally unacceptable, except in extremely rare cases where the health of the mother is in extreme jeopardy. Again, we mentioned a tubal pregnancy where um, that the, the baby would not live, the mother would not live. Uh, that's technically not an, abor an abortion as we talk about it usually. Notice the Christian view then. The Christian view of personhood is a substantial view which recognizes personhood because of what one is intrinsically. If you remember the pro-choice view, it is a uh, operational view. That is, unless a person can do certain things, they should not be granted personhood. And that's why they make the argument that uh, the baby in the womb is not able to do things that an adult could do, therefore it doesn't deserve personhood. And last week we looked at all the contradiction in that idea. The Christian view says that personhood uh, is a substantial view. That is, the very fact that a, an embryo, uh, from the moment of conception, is human, that that person is made in the image of God and therefore deserves to be recognized, and notice it recognizes personhood, merely because the fetus is made in the image of God. That contrasts to the pro-choice view that says that someone, the mother or uh, the courts, or the government, the state, someone has to grant the embryo and the womb personhood. Uh, and we looked last week at all the problems with that view. So this recognizes that personhood is directly connected to being human. So from the moment of conception, a new human life is necessarily a person because of the image of God and all humans. 
This makes the question of life very simple. From the moment of conception, uh, the, a life ought to be protected. The Christian view says there's no transition during the life cycle of an embryo, and here's a picture of an embryo in the womb. There's no transition in the life cycle of an embryo after conception that can mark a definitive change in its existence or development. In other words, at conception, we know something new happens. There's no other time in the life of the embryo, the fetus, or the baby in the womb where anything definitive happens where someone could consistently say, okay, now this embryo is human and deserves protection. Now, the way God has designed conception procreation is that from the moment of conception, there is a transition that is constant as the embryo grows, and there's no way to put your finger on one part of that nine-month growth and now say, uh, this is now human. So personhood is either recognize a conception, these are our choices, or an arbitrary standard must be forced upon it. And that's exactly what the pro-choice movement does, the pro-abortion uh, view. It says at some point we will grant personhood to this baby, usually when the baby is born. But we saw last week the inconsistency with that. Um, a baby that uh, there's an attempted abortion who lives um, traditionally up until recently, recent legislation, could be getting killed by the doctor. And certain ethicists like Peter Singer argue that up to two weeks after birth, the mother ought to have the right to end the life of the baby. In other words, if you don't grant personhood at the moment of conception, then any other time you grant it, it is arbitrary. There's no scientific um, change that takes place. There's no other uh, clear development from conception through birth. Uh, that child remains the same as a person made in God's image. So this view says that being human equals being a person. And this is consistent. Remember the previous view where hum being human and being a person were separated. Uh, this view says that being a human equals being a person. And uh, this is the foundation of the pro-life view. And from the moment of conception, that fetus, that embryo, which will grow to be a baby, is human and therefore deserves the protections of personhood. One of the best arguments uh, for the pro-life position is what's known as the SLED argument against abortion. This argument basically says the only difference between the baby in the womb and the baby outside the womb, five minutes after delivery, are these things, these four things, uh, used by the acronym SLED. So the baby in the womb is only different from the baby outside the womb in four ways. Size, uh, obviously the baby in the womb typically is much smaller than the baby outside the womb, except around the time of birth. But we certainly don't ascribe greater value or personhood to someone who's bigger. Otherwise, I would have more personhood than most people because of my size, and yet we don't do that. We don't say a tall person or a big person is of more value than a small or short person. Secondly, level of development. Uh, we certainly would argue that there's no difference in value, um, human life-wise, between a one-month-old and a ten-year-old. And yet the only difference really between them, or one of the main differences, is level of development. And in the same way, if that's the case, then in the womb, uh, the, there, we just have different levels of development. But left untouched, left to itself, a normal healthy pregnancy will result in a baby being born, a viable baby. And therefore, level of development should not determine whether a baby in the womb is a person or not. Thirdly, environment. Whether it's in the womb or outside the womb, um, there is no difference in the value. And of course we know that. Uh, a woman in some states can decide <clears throat> a few hours before she gives birth, maybe going into labor, I don't want this baby anymore. And in some states, including New York recently and others I've heard of, uh, Illinois, Rhode Island, I think California also, Right up until the moment of birth, if the mother decides, I don't want this baby, she can elect to have an abortion. However, as soon as that baby is born, uh, it has rights and protections. Well, that, that's inconsistent because it's just a matter of environment. There's no change that takes place in the baby between um, pre-birth and birth. And then finally, degree of dependency. Um, there's no difference in, hum in human worth between... Um, 
someone who needs a lot of help and someone who can help themselves. Again, just take the case of a one-month-old baby. It is essentially helpless or totally helpless. And yet no one is making the argument that that baby, because it's dependent, uh, should not have the right to live if the mother doesn't want it to. Uh, so even within the womb, the baby is completely dependent upon the mother, and when it's born it will also be dependent, and therefore that should not determine uh, its value in life or its personhood. All these criteria, by the way, are true of most people at different times in their lives. Uh, as people get older, their degree of dependency begins to grow again. Uh, we don't take away their life, at least uh, most nations don't. When we get to the issue of physician-assisted death, in a few weeks we'll see that some are pushing that, that once a, a person reaches a stage in, in their life where they require many resources and are not productive, that their life should be ended. Uh, well, we don't argue that generally in this country, and we shouldn't for the baby in the womb either. One of the most interesting cases is the case of Abby and Brittany Hensel. These are sisters, conjoined twins, uh, and my wife and I began following them more than 20 years ago when they were first born. There were specials on TV about them, and every few years they would uh, present a new one about their growing life. These are two girls, and yet they share uh, a body. Um, they, their spines meet at a certain point, um, and uh, basically, they look like a, a girl with two heads, but they're two individuals. And the question is, what makes them two people and not one? Uh, there's only two arms and two legs. And in their case, each one operates the arm and the leg on their side of the body. And yet, everyone that I know of considered these to be two separate individual people. And if they are granted personhood, uh, even though um, they are not what we typically expect, we acknowledge that they are persons because each one has a center of consciousness, a mind, a brain, um, and therefore they're granted personhood. Uh, and yet, if their mother in the womb had wanted to abort them, she would have probably uh, been encouraged to even. Uh, and yet, they are fully functioning, uh, grown women today. Uh, and that, that points to the fact that personhood is not rooted in our typical expectations um, if we apply these uh, pro-choice arguments to them. Rather, we say they, they have value, they have dignity because they are made in the image of God. Notice some theological considerations. The basis for our view as Christians is that all people are made in the image of God. As God says in Genesis 1.27, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. So that's where our value comes from. Uh, God knows us in the womb. Pastor Steve preached on this recently, uh, that God knows us in our womb. He knits us together. And it's so fascinating to me that um, recently in the last few decades, now that we have mapped the human genome and we understand genetics, uh, there are videos of uh, DNA knitting itself together uh, as it forms. And uh, it's so interesting that the Bible uses the word you have knit me together in my mother's womb, when that's in fact uh, kind of the way DNA works. Uh, Jeremiah 1.5, as, as someone pointed out last week, God knows and has plans for babies even before they're born. That is, the Bible very clearly uh, indicates that the child in the womb is a person that relates to God already, and therefore we should grant dignity and personhood. And then finally, Exodus 20.13, Thou shalt not kill... Remember, sixth commandment, uh, thou shalt not kill, because we do acknowledge the baby in the womb as a human being, as a human person. Therefore, to kill that baby uh, is to take the life of another person and to violate the commandment. Now, there is a passage in the book of Exodus that raises some questions. Exodus 21 and verses 22 to 25. Uh, this is a passage that has... Uh, been interpreted several ways, and yet I think the Bible gives us a clear enough indication of what it means. So Exodus 21, 22 to 25 says this, If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, and she gives birth prematurely, uh, literally it says in Hebrew, and the baby comes out of her, um, gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, 
burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So some have interpreted this to be referring to a miscarriage as a result of violence if the baby comes out. Um, and it's a, re cause, it's a result of violence that it is, the baby is not to be, um, this is not to be considered uh, murder. Pardon me for one minute while I fix my slides because we have a problem here with the picture. There we go. So some would interpret this as miscarriage, and yet very clearly I think the text uh, is talking about um, um, giving birth. So in this view, a forced miscarriage only requires a fine, indicating that the life of a fetus is not the same as if the mother herself were killed. Because the following verses talk about if there is injury, um, referring to the mother, then then there's capital punishment, then there is to be a life taken for life. So some argue that this passage indicates that the life of the fetus is not of the same value as the life of the mother. Uh, but even if this mistaken view were the proper interpretation, it would not sanction abortion because the miscarriage in the case of this text is accidental. Accidental deaths did not require the death penalty in Israel. The correct interpretation, uh, I think, that we should understand uh, if her baby comes out to refer to premature live birth, not a miscarriage. So a penalty, be, penalty is to be paid even if the premature child is okay because of the value of the life. So in contradiction to the mistaken understanding of this passage, this does not diminish the value of human life, but, but simply, uh, but actually increases it. If the baby dies as a result of the violence, then the death penalty is called for here. Notice again the verse, verse 23. But if there's serious injury, if the baby dies as a result of this violence, you are to take life for life. This points to the sanctity of human life. And so this passage cannot be misused to diminish the value of human life. Notice some more theological considerations. The incarnation of Christ, Jesus coming and being incarnated as a baby is affirmation of the sanctity of prenatal life because God chose to begin the process of incarnation there. Jesus didn't come down fully as a man. He is born as a baby, speaking of the value of human life. Another passage people don't often think about is Galatians 5.20, where uh, Paul is forbidding, talking about the works of the flesh, the sins that are committed, and he says this in Galatians 5.20, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. The word witchcraft there is the Greek word pharmakia, from which we get the, the word pharmacy. And witchcraft included things like abortion-inducing substances. That is, in the first century when Paul's writing, they did have um, potions or... Uh, things that people could drink that would spur an abortion or cause an abortion, and that is forbidden. So what do we need to do with abortion? Well, there's nothing that we can do that will more directly and genuinely save lives than to voice our beliefs about the sanctity of human life. That is, as we live in this world as Christians, <clears throat> even though the church is not called to fight social injustice, that's not the calling of the church, as individual Christians, we should raise our voices against injustice. And one of the, the grossest injustices of our day is abortion. This can be done through peaceful protests, supporting pregnancy resource centers like Align Life Ministries, church ministries to support single moms, supporting uh, politicians who will oppose abortion, and preaching the gospel of grace to those who are considering abortion or those who have had an abortion. So what, what we are called to do in order to uh, promote the value and sanctity of life is to resist our culture, to seek to overturn legislation that allows abortion, to support preg pregnancy resource centers, um, and to minister to those who've had abortions, uh, to realize that there are consequences of choices like that, emotional consequences, physical consequences, uh, 
but to preach the good news of Jesus, that forgiveness is available when we repent of sin, and to come alongside people and help disciple them, help them to grow through this. Some people argue if you're going to be pro-life, then you have to uh, sign on to a whole bunch of ethical issues. So many argue to be truly pro-life means to be pro-life from womb to tomb. I see this on social media a lot. It's basically posted often by uh, those who at one time were pro-life, who have now become pro-choice, saying, you know, if you're really pro pro-life, you'll you'll think of life all the way through womb to tomb, which means that you in their view, have to be on the liberal side of issues such as capital punishment, pacifism, nuclear weapons, poverty, racism, climate change, immigration. In other words, if uh, they would argue to be consistently pro-life, you must oppose uh, anything that might end life and you must affirm any attempts to, um, to help people regardless of the details of the situation. And, and that I can understand why people uh, believe this. It sounds consistent. And yet it fails to make key distinctions. Uh, let's take immigration, for example. Uh, I think as a, as a country, we ought to be pro-immigration. We ought to welcome people here, but we ought to invite them to do it in the right way, legally following the accepted rules of wisdom, as most countries in the world do with their borders. Being pro-life does not mean that we must open our borders and let everyone in that wants to be in. Uh, people sometimes misuse biblical passages about treating immigrants and, and uh, imagine that that same thing applies today without distinction. Uh, some would argue that we must be um, radically um, pro-environment or to be radically... Um, uh, concerned with and agree with whatever we are told about climate change. Uh, that's not true either. I, I'm a conservationist. I believe we ought to take care of the planet. And yet the mindset and ideology behind much of the climate change uh, fervor that goes on today is radically anti-Christian. It sees human beings as the problem in the world, and it's a desire to uh, reduce the population and to uh, close off parts of the world to human beings. Well, that, that's an anti-Christian viewpoint of that. So to be consistently pro-life, I don't have to agree with people on these particular issues. This argument that I must do this places a greater emphasis on reducing the supposed causes of abortion without doing anything to directly end abortion. For example, the argument poverty says any woman who doesn't want to keep her baby uh, because she doesn't feel like she can take care of the child financially, ought to be able to abort her baby. And yet that, that, doesn't, that doesn't address the key issue that this child is a person and therefore deserves the rights and sanctity of life. So this argument changes the subject from abortion and diminishes the heinous nature of abortion. Again, if you bought my book, then you'll know that the chapter I wrote in there on abortion I describe in quite graphic detail what abortion is. And I think it is necessary for Christians to know that so we're not confused about this issue. The actual nature of abortion is very gruesome. And the way that some people support their pro-choice position is they ignore the actual fact of what abortion is. And yet we need to face up to that fact. And the truth is Christians have done more for the quality of life in Western culture than any other group. So again, another meme you see on social media, another common uh, narrative is that Christians only want to keep uh, babies in the womb alive and they don't care for them after birth. Well, that's simply historical ignorance. No one in the history of the Western world has done more to save disposed children. In the ancient world, the enemies of Christianity admitted that the Christians did things that society was puzzled about. In the Greco-Roman world of the first century, when Jesus lived and Paul lived, uh, if, a, you, if you had a child born that you didn't want, it was perfectly acceptable in society to bring the child to the town dump and throw the child in the dump to die of exposure or to be torn apart by wild animals. And what did early Christians do? They hung around the dump, and when they would see a baby abandoned, they would scoop up that baby and take care of it. They would do the same with older people who were put out by their children. And the ancient enemy of Christianity, Celsus, admitted that Christians did these kinds of things 
and he uh, begrudgingly admired them for their care and concern. Christians have done more for caring for the sick and elderly in the Western world than anyone else, any other group, starting hospitals and, and funding uh, hospitals. That's why so many of the hospitals in the United States have Christian names related to it, whether it be, you know, um, St. Luke's up in Allentown or Holy Spirit Hospital in Texas or something like that. Uh, Christians have always been on the forefront of caring for people. No one has done more for the status of women than Christians. From the time of Jesus, where he allows women to be part of his inner circle and to travel with him. And uh, women had a key role in the early church to help uh, disciple and to teach and to train. Um, even though they did not uh, hold the position of pastor or elder, women were raised up and considered valuable. And that was a shock to the culture who considered women to be essentially either property of their husbands or good only for bearing children. But in the Christian church, while we hold the sanctity of women bearing children, something men cannot do, uh, something that is very significant for women, we also acknowledge that women have a key role in society and in the church. And that comes out of the Christian worldview, not, not other worldviews. Notice also all these things. No one has done more for medicine, education, poverty, human rights, science, economics, sex, and the arts than has the Christian worldview from the time of Jesus and the apostles. And if you say, Mark, where, where do I find out more information about this? Uh, D. James Kennedy, who was a wonderful pastor in Florida for many years, wrote a book entitled, what, what If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And each of these is an entire chapter in his book where he talks about what Christianity did in the ancient world, through the medieval world, into the modern world, for each of these areas of human life and how Christians led the way in these particular areas. So when it comes to the, the pro-life movement and uh, the Christian view of abortion, we want to keep focused on what is the key issue. It is the personhood of the embryo in the womb. And because of that, we cannot fudge and cannot budge on anything regarding abortion. Again, there are rare cases where a woman's life is put in danger by having a baby. And I think that's a, a terrible situation. Um, and when I, when I uh, pull my own college classes, most of the young men who are, you know, none of these students are married typically, most of them would say, I would want to save my wife. As sad as I would be to lose the baby, uh, I wouldn't want to lose my wife. And most of the female students say, uh, save the baby, uh, let me die. So it's a, it's a tough question. Another important question here uh, is what about abortion in the case of rape and incest? Uh, it is not an easy question. And yet there's plenty of evidence that points to uh, women who have experienced these awful scenarios and yet have said, um, I'm going to keep the baby because the baby uh, is not at fault for what happened. Uh, this child in my womb, even though it will be a reminder of this terrible thing that happened to me, is a person and deserves to die. And this is a, such a difficult question, but there is good testimonials of women who've decided to keep their babies after going through this and why that mattered to them. And then, as I said, how do we decide whose life to spare when either the mother or the child will die in labor unless the other is sacrificed? Not easy questions. And yet, when it comes to the issue of abortion and the pro-life position, we don't make our decision. We don't arrive at a conclusion based on extreme exceptions like this. We rather base our viewpoint on the personhood of the embryo in the womb. As God has said, I knew you in the womb. Before you were born, I knit you in your mother's womb. And so as Christians, I would encourage you as you think through this issue, uh, let us take the high value, the high view of the sanctity of life from the moment of conception on. Thank you. I hope this was helpful. I hope it has sparked some thinking in your mind. And may God continue to uh, rid us as a nation and a world of the scourge of abortion.